Paul was a man that could be seen everywhere doing everything. Paul had a lot of passion, courage, willpower, determination, faith, and an incredible amount of love for both the church and God's word. He was stoned, he was thrown in jail, he was beaten, he was bitten by a snake, he was blinded, and he did all this because of what he needed to do for Christ. We'll talk about that today. Paul's life is very eventful. Now, he was also shipwrecked, and he was misunderstood on many occasions. This guy, Paul, had an amazing amount of energy, and he couldn't have done what he did unless he had a, an amazing amount of energy. You know how you travel and it wears you out sometimes? Well, Paul did a lot of traveling, and, and he didn't stop once he got there. He just kept going and going and going and going. What do we know about Paul? Well, Paul, first of all, was a tent maker. That was what he did as a living. He made tents. Here is a picture of him working with the tents with his friends, Aquila and Priscilla. They are Christians also who Paul worked with in the profession of tent making. And Paul was born in the city of Tarsus. Now, how is that important? Well, Tarsus was important because it was a providence of Rome. That makes Paul a Roman citizen. Paul had also been trained, had been trained very well in the schools that he attended. But Paul was not always called Paul. As a matter of fact, he used to be called Saul. And what did he do while he was Saul? Well, Paul, when he was Saul, he would go around and he got quite a bit of entertainment quite a kick out of killing and persecuting Christians. That's what Paul did. He killed and persecuted Christians, and he was very enthusiastic about it. He really thought he was doing the right thing by killing and persecuting Christians. He probably thought they were crazy. And one day, he's going to Damascus to kill and persecute Christians, and he's all ready to go. He's got everything he needs, and he's ready to do some damage to the Christians there in Damascus. And while he's going there, he is blinded. God blinds him on the way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus. And that's when Paul's, the people with Paul, they have to lead him into the city, as you can see here, uh, when he can't see. He's a blind man. And that's basically when he's going into the city and he's basically lost all the pride he had in himself and all the hatred he had toward others because he had been blinded and he has started to become childlike all of a sudden because he's totally dependent on the people who are with him because he can't even see. Look at this image of this uh, blind man that Jesus healed. He's a blind man. You see him there getting the water out of the, out of the pool. Uh, the man's having to hold him there while he's washing in the, the water. Being blind comes with a lot of challenges, and it made Paul very dependent on others, and it kind of changed his outlook on life. But anyway, Paul gets his sight back, and that's when he gets introduced to the Christians there in Damascus. Think about it. The people he was going there to kill and persecute, he's now being introduced to, and he, he, he racks it up pretty good with them because God has set this whole thing in motion, and the angels have helped in letting the Christians know that, hey, Saul isn't Saul anymore. Saul is now Paul. And so they're all happy to, to eventually meet Paul as a new brother in Christ. And that's when he starts sailing around and teaching the gospel to everyone everywhere. He went all over the place doing this, and people actually stoned him for it. They threw stones at him, as you can see in this picture. He was stoned, but... People who saw him stoned, they thought he was dead. So they picked him up, and they started to take him outside to bury him, and he starts moving again. So they, he's still alive. So Paul just creeps going and growing, and it seems that the more Paul is punished and persecuted for what God is doing through him, 
the more he becomes invested in God and his word, and the more he does, the more he's persecuted, the more he becomes an advocate for Christ and his word. Now, one of the most interesting parts of Paul's life was when he went to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is important because it's a seaport, and there's a lot of sea people coming in, trading things, and there's also a bunch of land people coming in through the road to this great city of Ephesus. Here's a photo of it. Uh, it's a very interesting city, and what's going on in Ephesus? Well, Ephesus is a place where witchcraft, sorcery, wizardry, and all that evil spirit superstitions and teachings and uh, talk is. It's a very uh, witchcraft, sorcery type of place. This is a place where people are afraid of sorcery. They're actually going around wearing these little uh, little things, I call them envelopes, that were full of things that were supposed to protect them from these evil spirits and curses and witches and stuff like that. Basically, they believed that these evil spirits could stop a cow from producing milk or burn a house down or kill a child or possibly cause some type of uh, infirmity on, on themselves and they would wear that thing where they may have expected trouble or put something on the spot that they thought may be cursed by these wicked spirits and people. So, when Paul comes to Ephesus, these people are thrilled at what he has to say. Because he's bringing the gospel to them, and these people discover that God and his word are more powerful than these evil spirits, and these witchcraft, and the sorcerers, wizards, witches, and all that stuff. And they realize that if they have God, they don't really need all these omniclets to protect themselves from evil spirits, and witchcraft, and wizardry, and, and all that stuff is inferior to the gospel. So what do they do? They start taking their books on witchcraft and burning them. They just started throwing piles and piles of their books on witchcraft into the fire. They were more than happy to get rid of them. They're like, we don't need these books anymore. Think, And they were so thankful to God that he had provided them with something that could take that fear away. Why did they not have fear? It's because they had faith in God. That's why the people in Ephesus were so happy when Paul came to visit them. And that's found in Acts chapter 19, verses 17 through 20. Now, Paul was also in prison a great deal of his life. And he got thrown in prison several times for preaching the gospel and teaching God's word. And when he was in prison, and now keep in mind, these prisons are dark, dirty, damp, and unhealthy places. Very depressing places. But Paul found it an opportunity to write to other Christians in other places and to teach them and to help them and he used the time he had in prison to spread the gospel like wildfire to these other churches. And why did that happen? It's because when Paul would write these letters from these prisons, he would mail them to a place like, say, the church in Ephesus or uh, Corinth or something like that, and they would receive these letters, and they would read them aloud to their congregation, and everybody in the room would hear what Paul had to say. And then after they read them, they would sometimes maybe make a copy of them and send it to another congregation, or they would just take Paul's original letter and mail it to another congregation, and then that congregation would mail it to another congregation, and everybody who knew anybody would send Paul's letter to them. And that's how Paul's letter got everywhere, and how his letters became so popular. And it's interesting to note that these letters are still available for you to read. They're still in the Bible. 
How are they still in the Bible? Well, let's look at the books of First and Second Corinthians. That those were written to the church in Corinth. And what's so important about the church in Corinth? Well, the church in Corinth. Corinth was a Greek city, and it was the most important city in Greece. A Corinth, more, most important city in Greece. These people in Corinth had come from a pagan society, and they had a problem with false doctrine. Then you have the church in Ephesus, who had come out of witchcraft, and then the church in Philippi. The church in Philippi was a bunch of wealthy, rich dealers of purple for the most part. That's some of the people we see at the church at Philippi being with Lydia. Lydia was a very important part in Paul's life. And basically what happened with Lydia was that she was a dealer of purple. And she was in Philippi. And Paul met Lydia when he came to Philippi. And now, of course, Paul, being the first person to bring the gospel to Europe, and Philippi was in Europe, so this is Paul's first trip to Europe, and the gospel is just being planted there, and Paul's the one planting it. He discovers that there's already some people in Philippi who want to know more about the gospel. He says that they, they were going down to the river to pray every Sabbath day. And Paul said, well, that's good. He's like, these people are already interested in, in God, so I, I'm going to go down to the river to meet them. So Paul goes down to the river, he meets Lydia, and they're praying at the river, and he tells them of the Gospels, he tells them all about Jesus and God's Word, and they are thrilled to hear that because they've always been interested in the subject, and they, they accept the Gospel, and they're baptized, and Lydia becomes a patron of Paul, and she does a lot of good things for Paul in helping him. Paul traditionally would work as a tent maker, and that's how he usually made his money. He usually didn't take any money from other people, but from Lydia, being a wealthy seller of purple, Paul was willing to accept support from Lydia. And that was good. And when I hear the story about Paul and Lydia, I think of the song that's uh, we sing that's called as I went down to the river to pray thinking about that good old day uh, that's what what I, that's pretty much where the song comes from because as I went down to the river to pray thinking about that good old day and who shall wear a golden crown good Lord show me the way and that's exactly what happened Paul came and showed her the way to God as she went down to the river to pray. Paul was also bitten by a snake. And this was while he was a prisoner. He was on a ship and it wrecked and he got crashed on the shore and everybody's climbing up on the shore and they start, I guess they're cold, so and they're cold and wet, so they start uh, piling on the firewood. And while they're piling up the firewood, it's lit and uh, Paul throws some wood on the fire and a snake comes out and bites him on the hand, as you see here. And people see him get bit by a snake, and they're like, Oh dear, Paul, you're going to die. That's a, that's a venomous snake there. And Paul doesn't die. And because of that, people really start paying attention to what God has to say, because this man who claims to know God has just been bit by a snake, and a venomous snake, and he did not die. There's something to this. Uh, the, he must know the truth and, and he must know the true God because obviously something miraculous has happened here. Everybody else who we've seen being bit by one of those snakes has died, but not Paul. So we better listen to what he has to say. So what can we learn from the story of Paul and how he became Saul and everything he did? Well, the, the real heart of the story of Paul was that 
it was to prove that God, He doesn't offer you riches and power because you become a Christian. That's not what happened to Paul when he became a Christian. He did not become rich and he did not become powerful. What did happen to Paul when he became a Christian was that he had a changed life. And that's what God offers us. He offers us a changed life. We're not who we used to be. When you become a Christian, you become a new creature in Christ. And that's the story of Paul.